meeting at 6 o'clock. We're going to call to order this meeting of the Council Committee on Rules, Ordinances, and Orders. I'm Chairman David Murphy, Councilor Maureen Carney, and Councilor Jesse Adams are also members of this committee. Um, I'm going to announce that we have both audio and video recording going on tonight in addition to the minutes that are being taken at the meeting. Um, I'd now like to announce, um, oh, start off with approval of the minutes of October 7th. So moved. Second. All right. All favor? Aye. Aye. Um, is there any general public comment? Because I know there are people here for the marijuana question, and when we get to reopening or, or continuing our public hearing from that, I think that's when most people want to come. So anyone for general public comment? Seeing none. <coughs> we'll move on to our, our ordinance to amend 285-9 permits required for structures on streets and sidewalks. And this had been at our last meeting and we continued it to wait to hear from DPW and on October 16th uh, they made a positive recommendation on this one. So do we have a motion to send forward to the council? Yes, With a positive recommendation? Yes. Okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Aye. All right, and then do you mind if we take um, Item 10 and 11 out of order so that we have the, the uh, input from Council of Daniels. Then um, this is an ordinance to amend 312-102 and 312-104 with regards to parking prohibited at all times in a location on South Street. Councilor, Councilor Prima Daniels, for those at home, is chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission where this came from, so he's going to explain to us what's going on with this. Thank you, Chair. Um, this, these two are go as a pair, and uh, it was something that the Transportation Park Commission was trying to work on for a um, non uh, a grandfathered business. It's a uh, veterinary office that is up on South Street, and um, they have uh, they have a good number of clientele that comes in and out of their uh, driveway, and there are three parking spots in the front of the business, and. Um, Oftentimes, there's a there there are large vans um, and cons and work trucks that are built that are parked there mostly I think because of a resident who lives close by that um, parks his vehicles there and um, they they came to us because it's they've had a lot of difficulty with visibility with people coming in and out of the driveway especially coming out um, so the transportation parking commission after uh, some discussion um, has tried to alleviate some of it by uh, by uh, eliminating one parking space that's closest to the driveway and also creating two hour parking um, could still put vans or work you know commercial vehicles there but uh, couldn't keep them there all, all, all day um, so uh, those are the two um, bits of the changes of the ordinance that we're, uh, that we're putting through that we sponsor thank you any questions a motion perhaps Move to send forward to the full council of the recommendation. Second. Okay, so that's 312-102 and 312-104. No further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you for staying. Thank you. Get that taken care of. And now we reach the continuation of our public hearing on um, traffic mitigation. <coughs> Medical marijuana 350 2.1, 8.1, 12.2, and 11.6 medical marijuana. Um, just to set the stage for folks, um, Councillor Adams and I were involved in a joint public hearing with the planning board a week or so ago, and we continued our public hearing until tonight. I believe they closed theirs and made the recommendation. We're continuing ours because uh, Councillor Carney was not available to us on that evening. Um, so what I'd, I'd like to do, first of all, is have Mr. Biden's staff from planning explain to us what we have in front of us now, which is the version of it with the recommendations from the planning board in place. So the planning board closed their public hearings. They made these recommendations. You want to bring us up to speed with where the planning board left it, and then we'll continue from there. Sure. So case to back on the, the overall ordinance very quickly to focus on the changes. So. Um, <coughs> right now, if the city does nothing, medical marijuana uses would be legal. If 
somebody applied for a permit. Because um, we treat them as, as the same as the underlying use. So if you're selling medical marijuana, it's going to fit in any place where a pharmacy is allowed. If you're prescribing, it's going to fit anywhere where a doctor is allowed. Um, and the ordinance does not change that. It basically allows in all those same districts. It does some limits in terms of how close it can be to some sensitive sites, um, although not nearly as stringent as many communities are doing. Um, and then it does some things in terms of regulating to make sure that these fit in with neighborhoods. The, the example I often give is the security requirements that are based on these uses, but we'd like them to be more like banks where security is attractive than pawn shops where security is not attractive. Um, so they're, they're basically operational things. Um, likewise, because the state's only a license somewhere between 19 and 35 of these, they're going to be fairly high traffic uses. So we, we're treating them like we do other fairly high traffic uses. Traffic mitigations required, all the same sort of stuff that we do for site plan because of the high volume of these things. So that's sort of the background ordinance. A lot of the discussion uh, at the public hearing was about how far should these things be from things like public schools and daycare facilities and, and those kinds of things. Um, planning board felt that we want to have some separation between schools in particular, uh, you know, uh, elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. Um, but that medical marijuana uses are not places where someone's hanging out in the parking lot, smoking dope, or selling it. That there are very strict security requirements, there's you know cameras and the whole thing, and the whole point of these uses is for them to be like when CVS sells Oxycontin. It's not out there someone peddling marijuana from a cart. They're you know professional dispensaries just like drugs you can buy at CVS. Um, and the best way to um, regulate these things is to really deal with how they operate and make sure that they're not horrible eyesores, you don't smell things, that kind of thing, and not to try to form them off into industrial parks somewhere. Um, and if we had greater separations that some communities are using, then basically we'd be allowing these in name only in commercial districts, but we'd really be forming them off to very few places. And so that's why they did the way they did. Mm -hmm. So can you comment on the specific recommendations for the planning board? And I'm assuming it looks like a pretty familiar crowd from that other public hearing. So is everyone here pretty comfortable with what came out of that? I know we're, this is being televised. I want Mr. Fyden to go over it for people that might have missed that. But everyone here pretty up to date with what the planning board said. So if you make additional comments, it will be based on the status quo after the planning board, right? Okay. You want to bring us up to date with what they said? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing was the separation distance. There was a lot of discussion about that. Um, so planning board's recommending uh, no medical marijuana dispensary or treatment center be located within 200 feet. There are other numbers from <coughs> 300 to 500 feet bandied around. Of any elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or university, um, but not daycare facilities. So they both reduce the distance from these sensitive sites, and they, they limited what we're, we're regulating. Um, the other one which is never in here, but I just want to comment on, is the state has standards if a community doesn't create their own standards, which talks about in any place where children congregate. And I think we've always been very nervous about that from a, a legal standpoint. Any place where children congregate is everywhere from Taco Bell. I mean, you know, it, it's not a definition in the state law for what children congregate. And so one can make an argument that children congregate everywhere. So that was never the original ordinance and then the rest. So that was really the biggest change in those, those areas, the separation of what we're separating from. Mm -hmm. and the, actually, can you go over the entire new approval criteria on the last page with regards to hours of operation, building facades, yeah. ventilation, electricity, just those yeah, okay. A, A through F, I think, are the ones that are the, okay. the <coughs> ones that have people in their most comfortable. Um, so the first one is about the hours of operation. Now, generally for a special permit, the planning board has the authority to determine hours of operation. Um, but the fear was operators applying for a permit want to have some sense when they can operate, and neighborhoods want to have some sense. So where we might generally say, let's not list the hours of operation and leave it to the planning board. Because maybe, frankly, in some places, 7.30 makes more sense 
in some cases, 830 makes more sense. But just having a set of rules out there gives comfort to neighborhoods. And other so that's just set it at 8 to 8. Um, so the building facade is what I mentioned about. There, there are strict security requirements in state law, and I'm sure which our, our police chief would enforce in terms of cameras and security windows and all those kinds of things. Those remain in place. We're not trying to do anything which reduces the security requirements, but we want to make sure that they're, they fit in with the character of the neighborhood. That was the example of the bank instead of the pawn shop. So that, that's what B does, is we want it to, to fit in. We're not compromising security measures, um, but we do want them to blend into the background. If you want. Um, C, and this is probably covered by state regulations anyway, we just want to make sure buildings have to be ventilated so there's no odor uh, for marijuana, any place where clients are present, um, and no public exposure to herbicides and, and pesticides. Again, particularly the first part is probably covered by state law, we want to repeat it, and then the herbicides and pesticides for obvious reasons. Um, D, this is, you know, we know that if, you, if there were no regulations, people would grow marijuana outdoors or in greenhouse. Um, for security reasons, these are mostly being grown indoors with grow lights, which makes them much higher electric uses. And Planning Board is, is suggesting that we should require that, that extra electricity, the electricity that's required because we're using artificial light, should be supplemented by photovoltaics or you know some sort of renewable energy to make up for that piece. Um, so E is the one I mentioned. This is nothing within 200 feet of any elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or university. So not located in the dispensary or treatment center. Um, and then F is not within 2,000 feet of another dispensary or treatment center. Could you explain D a little more, please? So I mean, just, just, just how uh, a person is supposed to comply with that? So you can, you can calculate how much electricity the grow lights would use. And that's the amount of electricity they have to provide by either on-site photovoltaics or they could buy stuff. Well, what does that take technically? I mean, how, how much of an expense is that, is that going to be for something? Yeah. There, you know, just like anything else, the machinery has rating systems, so you can look at a light, and it will tell you exactly how much power that light uses. Um, so they can count. I mean, obviously, I, I couldn't tell you how many hours a day they operate, but a grower could tell you that. Okay. But there's excellent. Uh, to the point, if a person is living in an apartment in Singapore and they don't have access to, you know, the roof of the building to install photovoltaic panels. It just seems, first of all, people who are getting the uh, dispensation to <coughs> grow at home are doing it because of hardships. We're not talking about those people. This is about the commercial operations. Oh, okay. The, oh, the, well, I see. Okay, so... If you grow it, if you grow it at so home... If growing, so, so you're assuming that growing is being done in a commercial location? Right. So someone with a dispensary in Northampton could be growing the product in Northampton okay. or could be growing a different town. Okay, so this isn't for the individual. This isn't for the individual at all, no. So I, I do sort of share Councillor Adams... So everything else seems to be very much related to licensing medical marijuana. This one seems to be like a better place somewhere else. We're worried about energy. Is there anything else that's similarly regulated? Like like another, I mean, I, so they're, 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 we're projecting that this is going to require, we know that it's going to require a lot of electricity usage, so that we're hoping that we're mandating that, that they... Uh, Use an equivalent amount of renewable, renewable energy. Is there any other, anything, any other, um, any other thing that's regulated similarly that you can think of? Um, we don't have anything in zoning that's an absolute standard. We have a, one of the special permit criteria generally is is coming as close to, is meeting the criteria in um, sustainable North Hampton, which one of which talks about reducing energy use. So, for example, when the city applied for a permit to do Florence Field. <coughs> One of the commitments that's now enshrined in the permit is that site has to be net zero for, for electricity. So we have to put as much PV on the roof of the bathroom there as the it's water pumps that use all electricity as the water pumps that we use. So it's a criteria that's a discretionary criteria for the planning board. It's not, this is the only one that's black and white you have to meet this as opposed to being part of the And then you mentioned the last one was the 2,000 foot distance. Right. <coughs> and any other questions for Mr. Biden before we take? All right, then we will take public comment from anyone. And I, I, from the looks of the crowd, you're all up to speed with this because it's a lot of familiar faces from the, the last public hearing. But just if you come forward and you want to make comment on this, um, just identify yourself. And if you're representing an entity, tell us who that is. Or if you're 
a citizen, let us know what your address is. Anybody want to? My only one, that <laughs> really happened. Um, hi, I'm Marisa Hebel. Um, I am the coordinator of the Northampton Prevention Coalition. And you guys see me a little bit around this topic. Um, so, uh, I'm also a resident and a parent of two teenagers in town. Um, so last November, the voters of the Commonwealth approved marijuana as medicine and Massachusetts State Department of Public Health embarked on a thorough and lengthy process to develop a set of comprehensive regulations. Those regulations are designed to um, give access to people who need marijuana as medicine and to limit access to those who it's not intended for, particularly kids. Um, this ordinance in front of you uh, reduces some of the measures in the regulations that are designed to limit access. It also reduces some of the measures that are designed to help communities send a clear message that kids and marijuana don't mix. Um, so the Massachusetts State Department of Public Health spent months developing regulations and our planning board determined that they had enough information and knowledge to reduce the regulations. Um, and I'm here tonight to urge you not to pass an ordinance that reduces the regulations in any way. Um, so the portions of the ordinance that I'm talking about are on the last page, and um, th you know this may be something that the planning board understands that we just that uh, the, the North End, that that's my steering committee just doesn't understand. But um, so the regulation states the Mass DPH regulations state that marijuana shall not be visible from the street or other public areas. That marijuana and associated products should not be displayed or clearly visible to someone from the exterior of the dispensary. But this ordinance states that building facades and property must be consistent with the character of the neighborhood, including such items as transparent storefront windows with a view into the interior of the building. So these two sound contradictory to me. Perhaps there's some way around this that I just yet don't understand. But I just want to make that point. They sound contradictory to me. The Mass DPH regulations do say that if no local requirements exist, a dispensary shall not be sited within 500 feet of a school, daycare center, or facility in which children commonly congregate. So these are Mass DPH's minimum standards. Uh, this ordinance says that no medical marijuana dispensary or treatment center shall be located within 200 feet of a school. So the Northampton ordinance removes or any, of any facility where children commonly congregate, instead opting to list schools as the only locations where the buffer zone will apply. Um, I agree with Wayne. Our, our kids exist in a lot of places. They frequent and congregate in a lot of places in this community. Um, the Northampton ordinance does not include the words daycare center anymore, and the word preschool was removed from a previous draft of the ordinance. Now, of course, we do not believe that preschoolers are going to be purchasing marijuana. And I'm sure that Mass DPH does not believe that um, children who attend daycare are going to be attempting to purchase marijuana. They did, however, intend for communities to send a clear message that kids and marijuana don't mix. Uh, the North, this ordinance also reduces the buffer zone from 500 feet to 200 feet. Um, and when I talked to the planning board, I spoke with them about how model ordinances for limiting alco use, alcohol use include 1,000 foot buffer zones. Now, just to be clear, we have no desire for anyone who's purchasing marijuana as medicine to experience shame related to purchasing marijuana. Absolutely no interest in creating shame around having to purchase marijuana as medicine. Um, buffer zones around alcohol retail establishments are not intended to create shame on behalf of the person purchasing alcohol. They are, however, um, designed to create a clear community message that young people and alcohol do not mix, which is precisely the message we want to send with marijuana as medicine. We are a community that understands that our environment influences our behavior, right? I mean, so when we have access to fresh and local food, when we um, make it more difficult to smoke cigarettes, when we um, have uh, neighborhoods that are more walkable and bike lanes in our community, um, these things not only, we understand there's not only access to these things that's important, but also the message that it conveys to our community members, right? That we think that um, local food production is important, that we don't want our community's members to smoke cigarettes, and we want them to be more active. And we're not a community that's saying that we think that people with chronic illnesses are more important than our kids, right? Of course not. We're not saying that. Um, but we urge you not to reduce the regulations um, that were put out through a very lengthy, thorough process by Mass DPH um, and make that clear that we care about both. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thank okay. Anybody else out there that wants to fight it more publicly? Please come right up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arnold Bird, and I'm from uh, Swampscott up in the uh, in the North Shore, and I'll be uh, applying for uh, one of the R&D applications here in Northampton in the collaboration with the Tapestry Health, who is sitting here. I just want to make a few comments for some, for some questions that I heard recently. So one, when it, when it comes to some of these buffer zones, I think it's important to also talk about what are the actual security measures that are going to happen in these uh, in these R&Ds, kind of more in the uh, the real world, how to how to prevent diversion. So first of all. 
Anybody that comes into any one of these has to have two pieces of identification, one their own ID, and then another ID that essentially is given to them by the state. So they have to go through the process in order to get that. Now, they don't just go in. First, they go through a vestibule. They have to show that. And only then they can actually go, go inside. And that first in initial entrance uh, is going to be a completely secure. It's not even like a bank or a pharmacy or something. Like that. It's even more secure than that. And then you buy what you, uh, 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 what you, what you buy, and then you, you go out. Um, then th the other thing that the state has done when it comes to their version, and I think this is, this is pretty, pretty important, is if somebody actually buys something in one of the dispensaries, goes out and actually diverts it to, to somebody else, it's five years minimum. And I don't know exactly what happens if somebody catches you with an ounce to, today, what, what exact, the exact rules, but I think, I think you get a ticket as, as, as compared to what's going to happen in here. So, and the, the chain of, um, of evidence is, is pretty clear because you go in, you, you have to put your information into a database, it goes to the state, you go cameras, it, it clears exactly how much you get. So, there's quite a bit of security measures in, in the real world to try to, uh, to stop it. Now, is, is there still going to be people who will try to divert? I'm sure. But I think the state has tried to do as much as possible in order to, uh, uh, to stop that. I think a, another piece about um, the distances that I think is important to talk about is the coal memo that came out a, a couple of months ago. So um, it, it is true that the federal government at some point was, was trying to restrict how far things should be from, from especially of course from, from schools, um, and, and the DPH indeed uh, captured some of that. But in reality, the call memo came a couple of months ago and essentially stated that if there are states that are actually doing proper governance of this, and you have people who are actually running some of the dispensaries who are following the rules of the state, the federal government is not going to, uh, to go after them. By the way, and they said that very clearly, uh, regardless of their size. Um, so that really changed things, and, and I think that the variety of, of cities and, and, and towns, because we're not just applying here, we're also applying to have a center in, in Brookline. Um, they actually went through the very simil similar process here. They started with the state regulations, and said, okay, what do we actually want to do here? And we started doing some of the, some of the maps, and, and quickly they start getting to, to a point that literally in one of the last meetings, they, they removed everything around, um, around distances. The only thing that they, that they did keep <coughs> is something around um, schools. But it, it was interesting. In the meeting, there was pretty much consensus that there shouldn't be any distance because uh, there was one person in the, in the planning committee that talked about she was actually walking with, uh, with the cane. She said, look, even when I'm not very motivated, it doesn't take me very long to walk you know, 200 feet or whatever the amount is. So um, th they decided to, to actually keep it at the end, uh, but that was because they were going into, into town meeting and they, somebody used the term, it, it makes us feel warm and fuzzy that we're that far away from, from something, but in reality, these are not the things that are going to stop people from, uh, from taking it. Um, I just wanted to, to mention, because it, it's important to mention that 81% of the people in, in Northampton voted for this. So creating any kind of you know, restrictions that are, are going to make it more difficult to, to create this is, is not going to go in, in the right direction. Having it here, plus the uh, uh, delivery, just makes, means that there's going to be more access to people here in Northampton. And um, I have one final procedural point, um, which is, I know that we're talking about it uh, today and this is going to be uh, a meeting on the 7th. Um, if it would be possible to actually waive the second reading and actually do it in that, uh, in that meeting, it means that when uh, anybody who applies here in, in Northampton actually applies on the 21st, we essentially have a, a, final, a final decision. I'm sure that people would, would agree with that. Uh, so this is not just uh, for, for my application, but I think it's for privacy. So if that's possible to do, I would ask that we do that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Edward Etheridge, 64 Gothic Street, Northampton. I have, and I'm representing our non and the, <coughs> the group of Gothic Street. I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, one was in response to Councillor Adams' comment about the electricity. Uh, you already do do that actually for traffic, and in fact it's built in for this too. You see right at the top of that same page that the uh, uh, traffic impact payment is $2,000 per peak trip, and the peak trips, instead of being calculated by electricity use, have been calculated by planning to say that there will be 12 peak trips for a medical marijuana dispensary um, for each 1,000 uh, square feet of space. Um, I think that may be related to traffic regulations, but the point is it's calculated and it's in there. It doesn't really have an issue for my particular client since they're not doing cultivation. 
The other thing is, in this whole discussion, it keeps being uh, compared to pharmacies, um, and it's not really like a pharmacy. I, I remember when I did the permitting for CVS, and Paul Voss was on the planning board, and a couple other people who did not want to drive up, and there was some discussion about not having a drive up, and finally the CVS uh, uh, developer got up and said, um, look, we don't want to drive up either. Uh, and everybody seemed fine with that. He said, but we can't build a store without it. He said, we don't want to sell prescriptions. We want to sell the other things in the store. <laughs> and so our drive-ups are limited only to prescriptions. But it's for elderly or sick people who don't want to take the chance on an icy walk or coming from the doctors and not able to get in or for parents with small children. So when they do a pharmacy, the only thing you can get at the drive-up window is a prescription um, and s because they want you to come in the store and buy the rest of the things. These stores are prohibited from selling anything. And I think Arnon gave a good description of the security that's required. In other words, you don't even get in the store unless you can show your state identification card and another form of identification. And they can't sell anything else. Uh, they don't sell potato chips, they don't sell laundry detergent, they don't sell bongs, they don't sell the rest of the stuff. All, this is the only item for sale at this particular place, and the only people who can get in there are the people who have these cards. So it's a very different sort of circumstance than trying to think of them as pharmacies. Um, in some sense, it's a little more like a bank. It's not like a bar either. It's not like people can just walk in. It's not a public place. You can't even really get beyond the front door without those cards. It's, there are cameras. It's a very high security place. Obviously, the storage facilities have to be very high. The other thing I think that Northampton has done wisely um, is they have tried to limit it sensibly. Uh, and one of the sensible uh, regulatory limits they put in this ordinance is site plan review, which means that once you have identified a site, you have to come back before the planning board to see that you meet the traffic, the appearance, uh, all the rest of those things. Plus, DPH is going to regulate you for meeting all of the security and the other requirements that you have. But the community has a chance at that point, once a site is determined, to then have some input about the parking, the appearance, and most importantly, the location. You've already identified limited locations um, in your ordinance as to where they can go. But you still, they've got to come back before you for site plan review. As Arnon mentioned in the last uh, statement that he made, the sort of critical fact here is the stage two thinning out of applicants is November 22nd. Um, just as a aside for what a lawyer has to do uh, in any sort of commercial development financing, I'm required to give a number of opinions, one of which being a zoning opinion in that the project meets the zoning requirements or has the right permits, et cetera. I'm going to write the same letter in this particular case to the Department of Public Health, the, the licensing board, to say how a particular identified location would meet your particular ordinance and could be done. It makes it a lot easier for me to write that letter, and I know you're not thinking of how easy it is for me to write a letter, but what you're thinking about is what our non-requested is, if your approval is tonight and it goes to council Thursday, it makes any applicants who are considering Northampton much more comfortable in terms of how they then say to the state, we can locate one of these facilities in Northampton, as opposed to if council votes to approve, <laughs> if the regulations are not changed, and if whatever, then you could locate a facility in Northampton. So the application goes in with a greater degree of certainty uh, if council has voted. If they haven't, we have to write it with the ifs, but it goes in with a greater degree of certainty if council is able to vote. But I think the uh, regulations, as they have been uh, finally formulated with all the input that you put into them already, uh, are good regulations that allow the citizens of this community who clearly are in favor of this, having voted 82% in favor of it, of allowing that particular option to exist in Northampton with very sensible and protective regulation. Thank you. Can I just add something? <coughs> um, can I add something real quick? Sure. Um, so I'm looking at the regulations right now, and a couple of people have said that you can't get into a dispensary, you won't be allowed access to a dispensary unless you are a patient. So that's not exactly the case. So visitors will be able to enter the dispensary. They'll have to get a visitor identification badge 
prior to entering the limited access area. I just want to make that clear to people out there that you need to be registered with a medical marijuana card in order to get in, but that's not exactly the case. Does, does, does it state what the criteria is for being a visitor? So a visitor is someone who is attending with someone who's helping, but it's not the personal caregiver. Giver. So someone who's with an individual accompanying a patient who needs assistance obtaining access mm -hmm. to the dispensary. So if I'm pushing someone's wheelchair, mm -hmm. I get a visitor pass to get in. If you're helping in any way. So you walk in, but you're not necessarily a <coughs> registered. You're not, well, not only advance, people with... In advance, he needs to get a visitor card. You'd have to walk, no, not in advance. When, when you, you get there. Oh, when you arrive, you get a visitor card and you'd wear that identification badge while you're there. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wish to uh, make comments at this point? Going once, going over there? Okay. Hi, I'm Meredith O'Leary, Public Health Director for the City of Northampton. Um, I spoke at the public safety meeting. I'm not going to um, go over that presentation I gave you, but I just want to mention a few other things so we can hit home again to you and to the audience. And that just highlight the points you want to, because this is a separate meeting. Mm -hmm. This is the public hearing that was a, a different meeting, and this one's being recorded and will be watched by different people. So okay. feel free to say anything you want. Sure. One of the recommendations that the Board of Health has made is uh, keeping the 500-foot buffer zone requirement in the um, zoning ordinance. And again, this is not to, uh, to, to shame anyone who is purchasing the medical marijuana. We realize that it doesn't, probably is not going to have any effect on you know, um, diversion of the product. Again, what we're trying to do here with this 500-foot buffer is to reduce exposure to children, which is, I think is very, very important when we think about that. Um, and there is a definition um, about where children congregate. I think when we, we talked about, you know, that really opens it up, this, this, this language that they used in the state regulation, you know, it's 500 feet from schools, um, I can't, let me see, daycare facilities and where children congregate. How they define that in their FAQ section is that um, a facility where children congregate includes dance schools, gymnastic schools, etc. if children commonly congregate there in a structured schedule manner. It includes facilities where services or programs targeting children or youth take place. It includes a private home housing, a family daycare center, but not a private home where children happen to live. It includes a city or town park if the park includes play structures intended for children to use. It does not include other facilities such as ice cream shops where children may happen to congregate but not in a structured, scheduled manner. So I think, you know, if you were actually thinking about including that language, it is really well defined what they mean by where children congregate. And I really think that we should have a buffer zone between um, a medical dispensing site and a park where children are on the playscape. So also um, other recommendations that I made to the board that I spoke to you earlier in the public safety meeting was thinking about an RMD being on or near a public transit line. Again, I don't have a certain distance on where it should be. It's just a recommendation. So there's more access to the community members and the surrounding communities. And in the same breath, um, also having, if we were ever slated to have two dispensaries here in the city, that they be enough distance apart from one another. Again, I don't have a, a, a number, um, but enough distance apart from one another where there'll be more access to the public, which will reduce also home cultivation hardships. So those are the three points that I'd like to make. Again, it's not restricting, it's just making it more accessible. So I'd like us to change that language when we're talking about, you know, um, being near a public transit line and having operations within a certain distance of each other. Okay, thank you. Mr. White. I just want to give you a math, if I could. So when Meredith asked our GIS person to do a map of there's different interpretations of these 500 feet, but this was a map on um, if you're doing 500 feet away from everything which could qualify as schools or areas with, where youth congregate. And I don't I can read this. But, um, but the, the plan board's concern is it leaves out sort of lots of places where, the, you know, if we talk about not wanting to stigmatize populations. Mm -hmm. You know, basically all of downtown, all of downtown Florence, 
all basically all the pedestrian friendly areas of, of the city would be excluded. Um, and if you overlaid where is it bus services, then a lot of the other commercial areas fall out as well. So the areas that are um, circles. This is five hundred. This is. And this is just. Uh, Under the most expansive view of it, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. So the areas that would be allowed to be just the same. Yeah, for most of this is. Disallowed. But that's not entirely accurate because that was by parcel and it would be, um, as stated in the regulation, it'd be from the building, not from the parcel limit. So there is some room in there. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Leslie Tarlori, and I'm the President and CEO of Tapestry Health, and um, our regional office for all of Western Mass is based in Florence. Um, and why I wanted to just say a few words tonight was to underscore how important I think it is for Northampton to be a leader in the manner in which it creates its regulations related to medical marijuana. And the experience that Tapestry has had over the last 17 years in dealing with the needle exchange program, I think, is really instructive. Um, the needle exchange program that is run quite successfully is based in Center Street, right on Center Street. And if you use the 500 feet marker, uh, we would not have been able to open that needle exchange in terms of um, the fact that we would be too close to the People's Institute where um, a school program happens. Um, so what I would strongly suggest is that we really think of the difference between medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. And what I hope Northampton will do is, as it did with needle exchange, basically keep its hands off the details of how many feet something is from some other place, but rather appreciate the fact that what is going to be going on within the framework of the building and the service is really what's key. And what we'll look forward to is public health professionals working there. The needle exchange program is not allowed to serve anyone under the age of 17. And I don't feel as if the fact that the Iron Horse is close by or the fact that teenagers use our family planning services, which are literally on the same floor, do not do anything to increase um, a young person's drug use. What we're really interested in seeing is responsible behavior. And part of that is the way we as adults create an important new medical service for citizens in our community who need medicine. And I think if we remember that, it will help us eliminate some of the fear and some of the regulations that are being talked about today. Um, the fact that, and I really want to commend um, you know, all of the committees that I've gotten the chance to hear from and the Planning Board and the Board of Health who have done intensive looks at this. And I'm um, pleased in looking at um, the listing that the Planning Board has given you, but I would hope to even eliminate further the 200 feet marker. And I would even say that to me it isn't helping people uh, to have access to have dispensaries 2,000 feet from each other. Again, earlier tonight, we heard one <coughs> counselor speak of letting the market basically determine where is the best place for a dispensary to be. And Tapestry did have an experience where, with our needle exchange program, we actually had one which was at the Department of Public Health in addition to one on Center Street. And it was actually the one that was more central in Northampton that for some was much easier to get to. So I think that when we think about access, we need to think about who it is that we're really expecting to come to these dispensaries. So again, I am proud to have worked in Northampton for 40 years and very, very much look forward to seeing Northampton being the model for the state as to how 
uh, community can deal responsibly with a new medication that can help people. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If so, please come on up. Going once, going twice. Thank you. <coughs> um, motion to close public here. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. We'll uh, begin our, our deliberation. Please. I agree that, that kids and marijuana don't mix. I agree with that statement. And I appreciate um, the Prevention Coalition and its work. The reason why I support the 200 feet buffer, or I actually support no zero foot buffer, <coughs> is because um, I don't think it'll have any uh, effect in, in uh, keeping marijuana away from children, minors. In fact, I don't have that concern because of the great security measures. I heard a couple of times that we do want to send this message that we don't want minors using marijuana, and I agree entirely. But if we want to send a message, I think the way to do that is by a council or a mayoral resolution that states that. Because that's where um, we can state um, what, our, what our values and goals are. But, but as far as legislation, I don't think it really belongs there because it doesn't really make sense. As far as legislation goes, I don't think that um, it'll have the effect, it'll have any effect. Um, as, as we heard, um, there's really not much of a likelihood of um, anyone who doesn't have the proper ID going in there at all, uh, minors or otherwise. So um, if there is some evidence that states that um, having pharmacies uh, very close to schools does increase the likelihood that, that um, minors will get drugs illegally, I'd like to see that. But I don't know of any such um, data. But if there is, I'd like to see it. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy if the Prevention Coalition would draft a resolution, and if it makes sense, maybe the council um, can vote on it when it votes on these regulations as well. But that message doesn't really, um, this ordinance has to be a policy that makes sense, and the message is supposed to be separate from that. So that's why I think that, I, that's why I support the 200 foot buffer, but I would support the zero buffer uh, if that motion would come before us. Um, <coughs> Oh, do you have any comments? Um, uh, no, I don't really have much more comments. I do, um, I, I am persuaded though by the, um, the map, especially that, lo that really looks at the limited area that would be allowed. And, and then make the distinction between what's clearly um, been voted on by. Uh, the electorate and is clearly a need <coughs> for medical marijuana dispensaries, and then the need to be able to have those uh, accessible. I'm also um, somewhat persuaded by the arguments that um, that proximity to transit, you know, should be there for for those who really need to access dispensaries. But I'd be willing to wait until the council meeting to hear if there's something else that can be tweaked around that. Generally, I'm in favor of the way this has come before us. And um, I think relative to transit, I think that's where I go with the uh, comment from earlier about let the market drive that. I think if, if you're placing any sort of facility, um, you know where your customers are coming from, you know if they need transit or not. And I think the operators of facilities like this are probably very keen to the fact that they can't do any business if their customer base can't get there, so they probably will want to be <coughs> someplace that, that they can get to. The only thing that I find in here that seems out of place to me is D, where the planning board inserted electrical use requirements that in fact don't, are not imposed on other businesses. Um, it seems to me that in this instance, it could put a burden on this operator one way or another that isn't placed on any other business. <clears throat> so I would I'd very much bite at taking that out of there if I can get any play from you folks. Not that I have an objection to Northampton deciding to do something across the board to encourage energy efficiency, 
but just single out this one industry because it happens to be permitting now and it's convenient it doesn't seem to be the way to, to do an energy policy. Um, so uh, um, I'll move to strike the. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, then uh, modify it by removing the all in favor. Aye. A motion then on recommendation if everybody's comfortable with the rest. Do you want to change the one on the I'll move to strike F. Um, I, the one, the the big <coughs> point that I heard was that there's a concern that this, without this. Um, Without this requirement, there might be a greater tendency for uh, home growth. Yeah. I, don't, I don't necessarily. For, for folks at home in the audience, F is the 2,000 foot separation between two potential dispensaries. If in fact we get two, I think we're pretty sure we'll get one, but we don't know if we'll get two. So that's what Councilor Adams is speaking about. Mm -hmm. You have a feeling on that? Um, I can second. Discussion on that? Um, All in favor? Aye. Aye. I, I'm not going to support that one, but uh, it passes anyways. And, um, no problem with that. Then, how about a motion on the what remains, um, which is basically A, B, C, and E? So I'll, I'll then move to send as amended. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Very good. Thank you all. <coughs> and we'll give you a minute. We, I, we have a very exciting agenda to continue with today. <laughs> to stay and talk about park <laughs> And we will, uh, for those of you that are concerned, we will recommend to the council that because of the time constraints, the two readings are done on this, except the fact that it's up to the infinite wisdom of the council exactly if they're going to do that or not. But we certainly will tell them that, because our next meeting is until the 21st, that it would be helpful if they would act on it in two readings this coming Thursday. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll just take a little bit of break while everybody goes, and then I think the rest of our agenda will <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to do for the remainder of our agenda. Uh, the stormwater, which is 280-1 and 280-12, uh, we've scheduled for our meeting on the 18th. This is the to make permanent the temporary four-way at Jackson and uh, Woodlawn and and, uh, and Prospect, and it's worked successfully, and we want to make it permanent. So. But it's where it seems. I mean, as all your experience has been, that positive feedback across the board. Okay. So this would let us. They could get it in before the snow flies and ground freezes and freezes. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. So 10 and 11, we've already done. Um, 12 and 13 are to correct an error. Uh, Councilor uh, Spector had asked for handicapped space on Henshaw Avenue. Yes. And it appears that the measurements were provided incorrectly and the space was put in the wrong place. So what we want to do with 12 and 13, which is 312.117 and 312.103, is to move the spaces where they were actually intended to be by correcting the measurements. And um, they will also want to do that before it gets too cold to mark the streets and do those things. <coughs> so we we just did this. They just put it in the wrong place. So we need to move it down the street a little bit. So do we have a motion on these two? I move to send forward with a positive recommendation. Both of them. Second. Okay. All right. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Good. Um, and that the will probably.
probably also want to do two readings on it if we need to, just to let them get going on that. It's, it's a lovely space. It's just not what it's supposed to be. Do you want to request two readings on the following also? Yeah, probably two readings on that one and two readings on the, the marijuana one. And perhaps even two on the parking, because the parking space ones and putting up signs, I think they'd like to do before the weather gets bad. And if we do two readings, it'll be December before they issue the work orders. So, is that we done on your agenda? We're done on mine. Uh, well, only that under new business, if we're doing a hearing on the 15th and we've already added on ordinances from the ordinance review committee, do you want to consider not having a December 19th? Only because, again, like you said, of public safety, and we're here, a lot of things going on. I, you might want to consider it, but I don't know yeah. what to come up with. I don't think I'd want to cancel the 9th quite yet. I mean, my, in, in the spirit of not over-meeting ourselves, I, I wouldn't want to cancel it in advance in case there's something that needs to be done okay. ordinance-wise that we want to, but, maybe later. but we might, but you know. Let me just give you a scenario about, so December 5th you're going to meet, and I'm going to have on there a list of items that you can carry forward or let die in this session. If you meet on December 9th in the Ordinance Committee and have any items that you need to continue, then December 19th we have to do that mm -hmm. again. But mm -hmm. it's just a concern. I think, yeah, the 9th, I think the 9th would be, because we're wrapping up, only something that Council specifically asked us to deal with. Mm -hmm. So if Council doesn't pop up something on the 5th that they want us to do, we could at that point say, oh, one meeting on the 9th. Uh, because anything we, it would have to be acted on in two readings at the next meeting or carried over. So I agree with the spirit of that, but let's wait a little while longer before we pull it away. And, and if council doesn't have anything that they want us to do, I'm all in favor of not meeting on time. Uh, that would make sense, very much sense. Any other new business? Okay. Motion to adjourn. So